I didn't think I was going to win that rally because after the first half, I was fucking like fifth. <laughs> There's only dog shit. They went rapid at the first half. Absolutely sent it. AI. Group S is very fast and it's about to get a little bit faster as we head in with the Rotary 7. I might make a car for this. I think we'll go gold. But I think I'm going to make a skin for this one because I know I'm, I'm almost certainly going to be using it quite often. I hate the start to Norway. Group S is fast, but it's only about as fast as Group B. It's not. Not generally much faster than Group B. Yep. They still got MSN. But it's not the good MSN. My dad's just sent me a message saying, I'll have a look around for a shifter. The bike still rides. Which is true. Technically. What are we going to have to do? Yeah, it is nasty.
wing it? What's wing it? <laughs> I probably have it if you're saying that it should be installed by default, but uh... If it's a default install then... Sure. I probably have it. Otherwise... If you think it should be installed by default, I should probably know what it is so I can install it. <laughs> or at least look into installing it if I think I want it. It's always worth, when someone says, I can't believe this isn't installed by default, it's always worth looking into it, because that means it's something that someone can't live without. Our oh, Windows Package Manager. Of course it's not installed by default. That's not how Windows works. It should be, yes. Package managers should be the default for everyone. But uh, Homebrew isn't installed on Mac by default. So... you got to install... You've got to install Brew to be able to install other things and that's like a pretty you know everyone can use that what happened to that chocolate one that was a windows package manager the last time i saw one The trouble is with Windows package managers is you're always going to have to leave them at some point. Because they can only provide software that they're legally allowed to distribute. And... Linux, in general, the ecosystem is so built around package managers that... Anyone who's developing an app that goes on Linux is going to want it in a package manager. Because it gives you a certain air of credibility to be in the package manager, even if it's the AUR. To me, if you've got a fancy, fancy ass website and a Linux download and you're not in the AUR, that's dodgy as fuck. I'd rather use Gen 2 with a dual core. God. Actually, no. Gen 2 with a dual core wouldn't be too bad. Because if you've only got a dual core, you're probably not going to be installing stuff that's going to take that long to compile. Right? You're not banging on something that updates only updates every day. You know, you're going to install Firefox LTS. I've never had a problem compiling Firefox, actually. Yeah, it just takes time, it's not... It's not like something that breaks. Like, I've had problems actually compiling OBS before. OBS is a program that I've ran into issues when trying to compile. Gen 2 is such a weird system because it feels so much like nobody could possibly actually use it as a daily driver. And that it must be just like a, a fun thing to do because you have to compile all your updates. So it's kind of it's like a game in its in a sense. But no people genuinely use it. People use it for workstations as well. People get actual work done on Gen 2. Which is insane. Considering when I first started Linux someone told me don't ever use Arch if you want to get any work done. Arch is basically a game. They were 
saying to me. If you want to get work done, install a stable distro, a Fedora, uh, an Ubuntu, a uh, Debian. Yeah, I suppose you have to change your habits of updating. Rather than just running yay every couple of days. You've got to update the packages that you actually need to update. you got to keep an eye on the change logs to find out when stuff is actually an update that you really should be updating. Rather than just relying on... Uh, relying on a pop-up to tell you that there's a, a security vulnerability and you need to patch now an update now versus oh there's just some regular updates just just update whenever you feel like it is mine turns up every day tells me the number I don't even know if it does do security vulnerabilities actually Ubuntu used to when I was on Ubuntu it'd tell me the severity of updates that I had Obviously, with the less they were less frequent because it's not a rolling release. I actually had the Arch website pop up almost like malware the other day. Just at random it opened a tab in my Firefox. And I don't know if I pressed something or what happened, but it was like, this feels very Windowsy, just having something randomly ass pop up. The only thing, like, I don't know if I pressed a keybind. It happened twice though. So there's a chance that it was a keybind that has somehow accidentally been bound or it's a default keybind that I just didn't know about and I've accidentally pressed it. Yeah, normal Windows stuff to just pop up a fucking box. Because I understand it when something updates. The weird thing was... So, I got the pop-up and for, for some reason my, my brain went into if I open Firefox and it automatically it opens all the old tabs and a new tab of something that I don't recognize opens. It's pretty much always there's been an update to a plugin. And I checked that it was on the news page for Arch. And it was... Uh, uh, and there was nothing there from like... A w the latest post was like a week before the date it popped up. I was like, huh, that's weird. Because I don't mind... Like, some... I know some people don't... Definitely don't want it, but... If there is a major security vulnerability... Just give me a pop-up. I don't mind. Flash. Flash that there's a major security vulnerability. I don't want shit every day. I don't want constant reminders that of what I'm running. I want to just... Get on with my life in peace. But... If there's something seriously important, stop me. Stop me from doing something, you know? Like Xenotic did it when um, when there was the update for security vulnerability in Xenotic. It had a permanent mark on the screen that said update to 8.6 today. Xenotic.org. Flashing around like the DVD logo. And you c there is a way to turn it off, but most people aren't going to. And for that one, you literally couldn't join a server, to be fair. But when the other updates came out that were patch releases... Uh, point, not patch releases, point releases. Did it hit the corner? Yes, eventually. It did take a while. Because there definitely were, the day that it came out, there definitely were people still playing without updating. And I was one of them. <laughs> because the funny thing was, I didn't know it was coming out. I didn't know they were going to release it. I hadn't been checking the channels that 
that had anyone talking about the release date and that they were actually gearing up for release. I barely even knew they were gearing up for release. I knew that they, you know, they were doing updates, but I barely even knew they were gearing up for release. And... But I, I, I go to on the auto build, the nightly version. Where it's not quite nightly, but it's effectively nightly. I update it every few weeks or so. I'd only updated a day or two before the new patch came out. So realistically, I probably had a newer version, other than the version build, the, the number the version was built against. I probably had a newer version with more patches in it than uh, anybody on 8.6. Or on the newer version. I probably had a newer version than them with more modern stuff. Still, even though I technically had a, a lesser version number. Computers are strange things. Big jump.
I need to think of colours. I'm definitely going to go blue. Corners that tighten are one of the things I'm worst at. Oh, it's bugged out again. It's gone to 100%. Oh no, I'm off.
I'm not very good at this game. Yeah, not a great stage. <laughs> I think I know what I'm going to do. What are the front? Pink, yellow, red. That's the ordered. What goes at the front? Pink or red? One's at the front, one's at the back. Yellow's in the middle. It's a bright pink. And like a, a very, very bright pink. And it's a fairly standard yellow. And a yellow and red are, if you've got RGB, oh no. If you've got a red, yellow, green colour gradient, red and yellow are red and yellow, 100%, 100%. Pink is pink. Pink in front. Fair enough. So the plan is the dark blue that I've got on quite a few cars will replace the 
uh, orange of this car. I believe that the default car has this orange in it. I think I'm fairly sure that the default template for this car is this livery. Because I think they used an actual livery for this one because it's got so many non-livery things like all the grills. So first off I need to take all these grills and move them to a new layer so that they can be kept. So we need to highlight all those. Then I'll take all that orange, kind of goldy orange, change that to be the blue that I want. Put a couple of other things on it. Put my face in the, in the side window, but not in the front window. Not quite sure what I'm going to do for the front window. Wait, this car doesn't have a rear window. How do they see out the back when reversing? Uh, I suppose van's reverse alright, so it's just difficult, isn't it? Why did the fastest car in the class that I want to play have to have the most awkward shapes as well? Because I've looked at this livery and it is not boxy at all. Like, it, it is a very complicated paper aeroplane of a, of a design. Going well. Pink in the front will probably look good. So those colours, those three colours are the jerseys, the leaders jerseys for all the three Grand Tours in cycling. Had to be that order. Pink is the first one, the one that's going on at the minute, the Giro d'Italia. Tour of Italy. Then the Tour de France is in the middle, yellow. And red is the Vuelta a España at the end of the year. And now I've just got to work out how you do a three-way blending gimp because at the I I know how to do a two-way. Well, it doesn't really matter because if you look at it from this side, it's going to be one way. If you look at it from that side, it's going to be the other way, isn't it? So red at the back makes sense, but so you it works if you read it from top to bottom like that. But also, numbers are upside down if you read them from top to bottom like that. If I put my number on the on the bonnet, the number's upside down. So you're technically supposed to read the car upside down, you know, while looking at it from the front. So technically, it's the wrong way around. Numbers are a different thing. Numbers don't count. Numbers are especially difficult when you're number 66. Or 99 in a crash. There have been some bike races that won't let anyone have the number 99. Quite often it doesn't come up, uh, but there were there was one when nine nine riders was standard. Um, they made the number the team that was number ninety and had the nineties. They made them use ninety through ninety eight rather than ninety one to ninety. Uh, but I think their team leader was still ninety one. <laughs> 27, that can be taken sub 27 quite easily. Most of these can be massively sub-minuted. 
Cheers, Turbo.